Hey guys, welcome back to Clownfish TV. This is Neon. I am not here with Geeky Sparkles, so I think I'm going to talk about comic books. Uh, I don't talk about comic books very much on the channel anymore because nobody cares. That's the truth. Nobody cares. The only time YouTube viewers care about comic book news is if it's bad, laughable, idiotic, they like to see Marvel and DC fall flat on their faces. They like to see ridiculous changes being made to characters. Actually, they, they don't. But they like to read about it and just point and laugh. That is the only time anybody is interested in actual Western comic book news these days. Very, very different from when we first started the channel, you know, five or six years ago. And... I'm going to talk about this because it's hitting everybody. It's not just us. It's not just YouTubers uh, that are realizing there's no money to be made in reporting on the Western comic book industry because it barely exists anymore. Or it's so small, it's not sustainable. Uh, this is the beat basically giving an obituary for comic book resources, which at one point in time was one of the largest comic book sites, comic book sites on the Internet. Uh, it was a very, very good site back in the day. I know people have a hard time believing that because it's been all, you know, clickbait and listicles and they're basically the uh, nerd flavored version of BuzzFeed. But they're going to talk about uh, the layoffs. Heidi McDonald's talking about the layoffs and the comic book journalism and where it's at financially. And I'm actually going to agree with her. Uh, Heidi McDonald back in the day was actually one hell of a good reporter. I don't know what happened to her. I think she got... People got to her. I think her peers are putting pressure on her to only say nice things in certain cases. I think she's putting pressure on herself because she's got to sell advertising. Nobody wants to uh, eat where they they shit, right? So if if you're looking to get uh, you know smaller press companies to do a direct ad buy, you're you're not going to take a steaming dump on the comic book industry or point out a lot of the problems. Uh, going on with the comic book industry. I, I don't think Heidi McDonald is stupid. I think quite the opposite. I think she's she's very smart, and I think she knows exactly what is going on and exactly why the industry is in the state it's in, but she declines to say anything about it because it's not in her best interest to do so, and she does not want to look like she is uh, backing up those YouTube chuds. So we're going to go through, we're going to talk about this. I'm going to point out as someone who runs multiple websites and, and I've been running websites for about 15 plus years now and I've seen some ups and downs. This is the biggest down I have ever seen. I mean, this is hands down. It's the ad rates are the worst I've ever seen them for banner ads, not necessarily for video, uh, not for podcasts, not for any kind of audio visual medium, but for Websites, banner ad rates right now are the absolute worst I have ever seen them. And I'm going to tell you that banner ad rates are worse on nerd sites than they are on pretty much any other niche. And, and I'm going to talk about that and kind of why maybe this is and what's leading to all of this, uh, this implosion. And basically, comic book journalism is over. I mean, it's, it's for the most part, it is over as a viable career option because the comic book industry, the Western comic book industry, for the most part, the direct market is basically over. It's not completely over, over. People are going to be like, well, my town's got three comic shops. And how are they doing? And what are they selling? Are they surviving solely on new comic book sales? I highly doubt it. They might be selling manga. They might be selling pop vinyls or tabletop games or back issues, back issue sales are doing pretty good. But I highly doubt that your comic book shop, your local comic book shop, if you still have some left in your town, I highly doubt any of them are surviving solely on new comic book sales, monthly comic book sales. It's not like it used to be. It's not like back in the day where everybody had a pool list, everybody was buying stacks of Marvel, stacks of DC, stacks of Image, it's a very different time. So let's talk about all this. Before we get into it any further, please subscribe for more pop culture news, views, and rants. Guys, if you do, you'll get a woohoo. My woohoos are not as good as geekies, but uh, here you go. Woohoo. Woohoo. Uh, is that better? Eh, it's not very good. So if you go out to uh, my Twitter, uh, that's at neon with a K. Kanine, as some people call me. If you go out to, if you go out to Twitter, you will see... 
you will see that I've been talking about the business of running websites and uh, digital journalism, digital media, and this is something kind of near and dear to me because I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, there are sites we talk about. There are sites we don't talk about. We are uh, very in tune, I guess, with uh, where ad rates are right now. And again, they are the worst they've ever been that I can recall, and especially in the nerd space. Now, um, this is uh, Peter Pischke, who's done some writing for us on clownfishtv.com. And I said, look, as someone who's run sites for 15 plus years, the ad rates on nerd and gaming sites are the absolute lowest of any niche. This is entirely true. And there are a number of reasons for this, uh, partly because a lot of nerds, you know, general audiences don't have a lot of money and they're not high dollar products. You're selling a bunch of $50 games, you know, $10 pop vinyls, whatever. So you're not selling like vacations and uh, sports cars and, you know, uh, life insurance and all that stuff for the most part to like the nerd crowd. It's, it's usually younger people that have enough disposable income to buy games and tchotchkes and stuff, but not really make major, major purchasing decisions yet or have the ability to do that yet, right? Uh, you know, two, that that scene is very tech savvy. Most of these people have ad blockers, you know. Uh, three, historically, there's been a lot of click fraud on nerd sites, on comic book sites. And I'm not even kidding. In fact, I think it was Penny Arcade. There was a documentary done a couple of years ago, well, by a couple of years, probably 10 plus years ago on web comics. And they flat out admitted that when they started Penny Arcade, the reason they survived and they made the money they made at the start was they kept clicking on their own ads. And the click fraud thing is pretty prevalent, especially in fan powered sites, because if it's not the site owner doing it, uh, a lot of times it's the fans of the site owner especially in web comics, especially, you know, anything like, Hey, click, click these ads. I'm not telling you to click these ads, but if you click these ads, you know, we get some extra money because I get paid more for a click than I do for a view. And that's, you know, historically how it worked. I know there were several ad networks that, uh, you know, we were aware of that would not even work with web comics or anything related to web comics because the click fraud was so rampant. In fact, we actually lost one of our advertising accounts for like 10 years. It took us 10 years to get it back because an overzealous fan kept clicking on ads on our page. And they're like, wait a second, wait a second. You had, you know what, like 5,000 views today, but you've had like 10,000 clicks. That doesn't compute, you know, so you got to watch it. So I think there's just been a lot of fishiness going on in, in this particular niche that they're just, they're noping out. A lot of advertisers are noping out. That being said, um, it's never been great money because the number of people that you need to make a website sustainable uh, outweighs the number of people that are interested in comic books. Let's be honest. The, when you've got the majority of Marvel and DC titles selling under like 20,000 copies or whatever it is now, how many of those people are actually going out to websites looking for news on it? Uh, you know, sites like The Beat cover a lot of indie comics. Well, that's an even smaller slice of the pie. So you're not talking Marvel and DC. Now you're talking, you know, Oni Press or something like that that might only sell maybe 5,000 copies of a book. How many of those people are going to go out to the website and look for information on this book or look for interviews with the creators of these books that they don't even know exist? You know, it's, it's, it's just a very bleak. It's very bleak. It really is. Not being said, sites like CBR and Newsarama and, you know, Nerdist, and they all pivoted into Hollywood nerddom because more people were interested in the Marvel movies and the Marvel video games than they were in actual comic books. You know, the days of people being interested or large numbers of people, large numbers of people being interested in actual comic book news um, are over. They've, they've been over for several years now. Um, so this is, uh, this is Heidi McDonald's take. She's talking about how CBR is being reorganized. We don't know what they're going to be re reorganized into. We talked about this before. They're undergoing uh, uh, major structural changes related to turning the corner on both culture and performance with those changes, meaning that as a result, certain roles will no longer exist. And we're focusing on individuals who can create a more positive culture going forward. I personally think there was a lot of drama behind the scenes. Uh, I think there was, and I think that uh, they were stirring, stirring the shit to get clicks. Uh, they definitely had writers that were going out to Twitter and starting fights with people. 
Uh, one of them, Ant, for sure, definitely used to whack the beehive and start fights with people on Twitter, and that's not going to do a lot for your views. You know, there's not a lot of people that are interested in reading about comics anyway, and you're chasing off a, a good portion of them. You know, plus all the politics and all that crap and just the number of ads If they get into an ad network. Then they just slather ads all over the pages and it makes the site damn near, damn near unreadable. So Heidi points out that uh, while comics news sites sort of are competitors, we all realize we're on the same tiny floaty in a rapidly evaporating kiddie pool. So there's a pretty collegial atmosphere unless you're on YouTube, uh, then you're, you're definitely the enemy. Uh, in fact, I, I don't know how involved Heidi has been in this. Apparently she was in the, uh, the whisper network or whatever, but, uh, I do know that there are discords and groups where disgruntled comic book, you know, freelancers and disgruntled, uh, comic book journalists and anyone who has an ax to grind with YouTubers or anyone that's not on, you know, part of this collegial atmosphere, right? Anyone that's not part of this group, uh, they are, plotting and scheming against them. And it's pretty disgusting. But, you know, again, it comes down to survival. I just don't understand why a lot of these people didn't pivot to video when they had the, the chance to do it. You know, I, I have no idea. But uh, here we are, right? Here we are. Uh, we talk, I'd been hearing that Valnet was paying less and less. That is true. That's 100% true. I, I can verify that. And asking for more and more work from writers for a while. And this week's layoffs and culture change brought many folks out of the woodwork on Twitter, including the Beat's former managing editor, Samantha Puck. Samantha Puck, who has me blocked for some reason. I don't think I've ever, have I ever dunked on her? I don't think I ever have. But this is what she said, because, you know, I'm blocked, so I can't read it over on Twitter. I haven't spoken publicly about this because I didn't want to burn bridges, but Valnet is a monster. Uh, yeah. I've heard I've heard that they're not they're not great uh, that they they pay like three dollars an article or something sometimes it's it's really low in 2019 I was promoted from one editor uh, position to another at CBR and given an accompanying pay increase but six months later when upper management talked about raises anyone who had accepted a promotion including me wasn't eligible because we got raises when we took on new positions. As a full-time section editor expected to be available 24/7, I made two thousand dollars a month. When I asked for more money, I was fired. My click bonuses for articles that performed well were also about half of what I should have received. When I asked why, they told me bot traffic doesn't count. Ouch. So there's a couple things going on here. Um, one, they do click bonuses. So these, and we've talked about this before, and I know this is a fact. They are incentivized to write clickbaity headlines, all of these outlets. I don't think the Mary Sue believes half of what they put out there. I think they know if they put something out there that's inflammatory, they're going to get views. They're going to make money. They're going to get to keep their position and they'll be able to actually write about things they, they care about. That's what I think is actually going on. Um, bot traffic though, that, that is also interesting because that would indicate to me that they think there was cheating going on at CBR, at Valnet sites. We don't do click bonuses on our sites anymore. We used to, and I'll tell you why we don't do it anymore, because we've had writers in the past literally buy traffic because they thought if they bought traffic, uh, we would give them a bigger bonus. And, you know, there were certain writers, you know, and I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to get into it very much. But we had instances where there were certain writers who their stories, like clockwork, always had massive, massive traffic, even when, like, if I would go searching for them, I'm like, it's not even coming up in the top five results on Google. Like, where is this? And then I started to look into it. And then it got so obvious that our host got involved and was like, hey, you have these traffic spikes, but we can't even tell where the traffic is coming from. It does not make sense to us what's going on. And then our ad network, you know, the ad networks that are really hard to get into. Yeah, then they start looking into it, too. And they're like, are you guys trying to swindle us or what's going on here? It was actually our writers uh, that were doing this. And I did not know. So I had to end. I had to end. Uh, click bonuses, which is really unfortunate because we have some really good writers. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of the articles don't pay for themselves. The The rates are so low now that it takes like 100,000 views 
for an article to pay for what we're paying a writer to write it. And it's offset with other stuff that does perform. But you know what I'm saying? So the economy of this thing just does not work. Now, I don't know if Samantha Puck here was participating in the bot traffic thing, or if it could be Valnet was just doing it, or maybe somebody at Valnet was like, let's just corn feed these websites to make it look like we're getting more traffic because, oh my God, we've got revenue goals to hit and we're not hitting it. Uh, I would argue that most of these websites, so I mean, I'm going to do a, a video talking about this. Most of these websites now, and we're starting to find out Vice and uh, BuzzFeed. And, well, actually, I'll show you, I'll show you something funny with uh, comic book resources here on their YouTube, on their YouTube channel. But I thought this was interesting. I noticed this the other day because I'm like, well, I know they were doing really, really well on YouTube comic book resources. They have over 4 million subscribers. Um, and I thought, well, they're getting, you know, they have to be making money on the YouTube side of things. They used to get millions, supposedly millions of views, millions of views on their videos. I think that they were just paying to promote their videos. I think they were actually, yeah, they're getting the views, but they weren't actually making ad revenue off of the views. You know, if you're, if you're running like an AdSense campaign or something, yeah, you get the views it'll run the video as an ad, but you're not actually going to get any ad revenue. And there's a massive difference between what their videos are getting now and what they used to get. And I think basically the money's running out. Look at these views. I mean, this is like, and these are things people are searching for. Spider-Man 2099, The Flash, Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, 9,000 views, 6,000 views, 7,000 views two days ago for top variations of, of Spider-Man. That's a video that, you know, right now with Spider-Verse being big should be huge and it's not. And you start going down the list and you realize that they have not had any videos. Well, this one about Captain Marvel did 20,000 views. I mean, th these are amateur numbers for an individual YouTuber, let alone a company run by Valnet. And the last time they started having, okay, so here's where it, here's where it gets interesting. Go back, go back a couple of months, okay? And you start to see that the numbers are higher. Shazam, 41,000, 27,000, 22, 39, um, 37, 68. Okay, if you start going way back, well, one, it's telling me that they're, they're probably bleeding organic, like actual viewers, right? But you start going back and, you know, it looks like the money got turned off at some point. Because some of the videos, like they were averaging, you know, a lot more views than they are now. And that was just a couple of months ago. And if they're having financial troubles, this actually coincides with all the ad rates dropping off. So I don't think they were making money on YouTube. I don't think they're making that much money on YouTube, uh, you know, comparatively to what they're spending probably to edit these videos because they're all well edited videos and to promote these videos. And uh, yeah, last time they had anything over 100,000 was like six months ago. And then you start to see six months ago, 188,000, 530,000, you know, and you're starting to see higher numbers. And I think that they were probably advertising because, again, YouTube does not show a difference between, um, you know, YouTube views that are required via advertising on, on AdSense, you know, Google's AdSense, or you know, video views that were organic, 153,000, 337,000. So what they would do is they probably are going out to their, their, uh, you know, advertisers, direct ad, ad buys and being like, look at all these views we get on YouTube guys. Look at this. This is crazy. Don't you want some of this? But the, this is the truth right here. This, this is how many people are actually watching their videos organically. And it's, it's bad. I mean, this is bad. So that's just, I'm, you know, that's, anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, their entire system chews people up and spits them out for pennies or the guys of building portfolios. Uh, yeah, all these websites were just, they were never meant to be a permanent thing. They don't, these companies don't actually care about the stuff they write about. They look for niches that uh, pay them advertising money. And as soon as that advertising money is gone, so are you. When I was there, everyone was a freelance contractor, which the company cited as a perk because everyone can make their own hours. In actuality, it allowed Valnet to deny benefits to employees working more than full-time hours and sever contracts whenever they wanted. That is actually very normal in this space because a lot of people have abused uh, working from home. It's the truth. Uh, when you know, I, I worked in this space and I worked, I was a freelancer. I was a contractor. I had to pay my own health insurance. I got paid more than these people did. So I, I could pay my own 
health insurance, but still. Uh, anyone who attempted to push back or ask for more was pushed out or outright let go. There could be two sides of that, too. It could be you guys are obviously asking for something we can never give you and and or you're attempting to bully us into, you know, going in a direction we don't want to go in. Again, they have a lot of activists working at these companies. I mean, a lot of things, a lot of things can be going on, but that is her her version of it. Uh, the statement CBR was looking to create a more positive culture, as you might expect, drew a lot of comment. The beat spoke with several people close to the CBR situation, and a picture emerged that this positive culture might not be positive. We're told that uh, those removed are actually standing up for writers, all right, and they pushed back against more changes along the lines of what Puck reported. Writers were being asked to do more work while shrinking the pay-per-view rates. The situation was described to me by one person as working writers to the bone. They're probably afraid you're going to unionize. Uh, do you want the truth? The, they're probably afraid you're going to unionize because that's what's going on, at like Gizmodo and some other companies. In that case, you're all done. What they will do is they will sell the website off rather than let you guys unionize, especially if the ad the ad money's not there. The situation is so dire that in addition to the three editors, I'm told two HR people were laid off. Again, they're not going to hire anybody else uh, who also objected to the demands that management was making on writers who, as a reminder, are contractors, not employees. Yeah. So in that case, I actually agree. If you're a contractor, it should be piecework. It should be like, this is what you get paid per piece. This is what we've agreed to that you get paid per piece. That HR people risked their jobs and lost them to stand up for the rights of contract workers is a situation I've not heard of before and quite the indictment of Valnet's working conditions. As awful as they can allegedly be in a way I understand any Anyone involved in creating online content for profit hitting the panic button. Heidi is not as dumb as people want to make her out to be. She's been doing this a long time. Okay, she knows what's up. She's just not, she's not standing up because she knows it's not in her best interest to do it. That is my personal opinion. It is not in her best interest, so she just lets the crazies uh, do whatever they're going to do as long as it doesn't take her sight down which is really unfortunate, but uh, I don't have the time to go into how shitty it is to be creating content on the web these days. I do, <laughs> but advertising is way down even more so than usual with recession or something looming. It's the worst it has been in the 15 plus years I've been doing this. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's that bad. It is awful. We are down on our sites. And I've told our writers this. I mean, we're not hiring anybody else right now. Uh, we can't. We are down to about 20, 20 to 25% of what we were making a year ago on our websites. No, that's not down 20 or 25%. We are down to 20 or 25% of what we're making a year ago. Um, two years ago, I mean, it was kind of on the decline anyway, because everything kind of peaked during the pandemic, but it's dire. I mean, and it just dropped off a cliff almost overnight. Everybody hit the panic button. They're like, do not spend money on banner ads. Boom, we're done. And then you see sites like Vice and BuzzFeed going down. And it just sends shockwaves throughout the industry. Now, video rates are fine. Podcasting rates are fine. Uh, sponsorships are fine. I mean, we actually have other businesses in addition to this stuff. Like we've got, we don't have all of our eggs in one basket by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so we can offset a loss on the websites with, you know, other things that we do, but it still is scary. And if this is your main business, if this is what you do for a living. It's really damn scary because the money's just not there. Um, the other looming threat is of course, AI. That is true. Uh, Buzzfeed apparently is going to use AI. Uh, my first thought about the Valnet changes was that the new culture might mean a pivot to AI. I don't think so, but insiders I talked to thought this was not directly the case. AI won't take over writing articles. Google is still officially against that kind of thing. Yeah, actually, uh, AI articles do not get prioritized in Google as I understand it. Like Google somehow knows that they're written by AI and they will downgrade those in the search results. Uh, at any rate, I pointed out on Twitter, this isn't the end of comics journalism because CBR wasn't doing much, but that is true because the money's not there. Nobody's, nobody cares. We still have ICV2, which I think is the gold standard. Now, the thing about ICV2, though, is that they are a, more of a geek gaming comic shop culture website. They cover everything. They keep their own personal hot takes out of it. Thank God. Uh, and, but they're more for comics retailers and business owners. Um, not really the casual so much, 
but they are a really good resource and I would hate to see it. I'd hate to see it go under Popverse, uh, which has actually been doing some pretty good work lately. Shelf Dust, never heard of it. Rob Salkowitz, uh, he's the one who said it was raining money, I think. Obviously not. Graphic Policy, didn't know they were still around. Women Write About Comics, I don't think they like us very much. Broken Frontier and uh, AIPT, and of course The Beat probably half a dozen other worthy sites I'll remember. Or, you know, we could just pivot the video TikTok because they make a ton more money. Um, you know, now they're going out and asking for money. So here's the thing. And I'm going to tell you about the money. I'll, I'll, I'll I'm, I, I don't care. I'm, I'm not trying to rub salt in the wound or whatever. I guarantee you, your average nerd, comic book nerd, anime nerd, whatever YouTuber makes more in a day than a lot of these websites make in a month. That that is the truth. Um, take it or leave it. I'm talking. I'm talking people that do it for a living. I'm not talking about the people that don't have a massive audience. I'm I'm talking about larger, uh, larger channels that do it for a living, or at least make enough money to do it for a living. They are probably making more money in a day or two than these web these comic book websites are making in a month, because I know what the rates are, and they're they're terrible. And even before that, though. I would wager that a site like the beat probably only made a few thousand dollars a month, maybe, you know, and that's, that's between like Patreon and direct ad sales. Again, I could be way off base. It's not my business. It's none of my business, but it is my business because this is kind of what we do. This is what we cover. And that's sad. It really is sad. I mean, there were some really good sites out there. They did not bring up bleeding cool. I don't think, which is really interesting because I don't think, I don't think they get along very well. As I recall, Heidi and Rich do not get along very well. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know what the I don't know what the uh, the root of that is, but but uh, Bleeding Cool is probably doing. There's a lot of clickbait on Bleeding Cool, and they seem pretty well optimized in Google. I would say that they're probably doing better than most as far as independently owned sites. But yeah, it's it's bad. It's really bad. And no, it's never going to come back. I think maybe people will start blogs or Substacks or something. And they might be able to make some money doing that way. But, you know, people wonder why, why aren't there any, you know, virtuous people covering the comic book industry? Why don't we have more people covering the comic book industry? So it's not the same dozen people. And it all comes down to the money. There is no money covering comics because nobody cares. The general public does not care about the Western comic book industry for the most part. And that's it. Money makes the world go round, guys. That is that is it. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, please subscribe for more pop culture news, views, and rants, and we'll talk later. Sorry, I, I yelled loudly. That's okay. I got I got the limiter on. Okay. So uh, you can tell my kick setting. Yeah, you can you can so you can Wait, tell. really it automatically limits it when it, I yell. It does when you get when the pitch gets too high. It it <laughs> it does. When sometimes if you sound like all robotic, it's oh because it's God. it's bringing the decibels down. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Help support the channel. Go to thereef.support and get early access to podcasts, videos, and other content. That's thereef.support.